we're holding Parashat Korah. This is a very sad parasha in some ways, because there's a lot of machloket, a lot of division, a lot of arguing and bickering. And it's no wonder because it follows Parashat Shalach, where there was already some dissension, some disagreement, some complaints. As it is, we had, we've had rather desert years, 40 years in the Midbar, we've had many situations where Amishad complained and got themselves into trouble. So Parashat Korach is another one of those incidents, another episode, another time, in 40 years, where there are groups of people that have something to say, something to argue about. Unfortunately, the, the, the bad part about Korach, as opposed to other groups, is Korach is a real Jew, he's not an added up. He's not from the mixtures. Not only is he a Jew, he's from Shevet Levi. He's a special person. He's not to, to be taken lightly. Just like the Meraglim, the spies, they were also very special people, they were at the top. But even good people who start off being good, who think they have good intentions, in the end, it turns out to be that their intentions were not L'Shem Shemaim. They were not for the sake of heaven. And that's what destroyed them. And that's what we're going to see in Pashat Korach. But before we, begin with, before we begin with the problems, it is obvious to all of us, it was obvious to most of Am Yisrael, that Moshe was the chosen leader. They did not have a valid complaint. After all, who chose Moshe? HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Not only did HaKadosh Baruch Hu choose him, it says, Vayaminu Bashem, Uvi Moshe Avdo. Right after they, they left Egypt, it says that the Jewish nation believed in Hashem, believed in Moshe his servant. So it was obvious that Moshe was the leader. Why is this important? Because a lot of people claim that a democracy is the best way, to, best way to choose a leader. And the answer is, Judaism tells us that that's not true. There's no such thing as democracy in Judaism. To choose leadership, it has to be by qualifications. A democracy, even though sometimes people by democracy can make a good choice, they can also make a bad choice. Why? Because many leaders have been chosen even though we believe everything is in our Shemaim, nevertheless, many leaders are chosen by how, what kind of an appearance they give. Perhaps they have very nice slogans that they go by, right? or they promise certain things, and people are influenced by that. So then people are not necessarily choosing the right leader, the one that's the most capable one. So even though democracy sounds good, and that's only in theory, but in reality, HaKadosh Baruch Hu was the best one to choose the leader, he knew who was best for Am Yisrael to, to, to lead the Jewish nation, and he could not have left it for, the, for us to choose. And in general, throughout the generations, leaders were chosen by their qualifications, whether it was to join the Sanhedrin, whether it was to be a rabbi or a community, a Dayan, a judge. You have to be qualified. And one of the most important qualifications was not only knowledge and wisdom, it was Yerat Shamayim. It was Yerat Shamayim Kodemer Lechokmato that the fear of heaven should be before his wisdom. That's priority number one. That's much more important than the Chokmah. So Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe Rabbeinu is chosen, just like Shevet Levi is chosen, by Kadosh Baruch Hu, not by human beings, because Kadosh Baruch Hu knows who is most qualified to lead Am Yisrael. That's number one. Another interesting point to note is that Moshe, you might think, was not the most qualified. Why? Anybody from, know? Because he, he stuttered. Yeah. And why did Hashem choose such a leader who had a stutter problem? Exactly for this point, to prove to the rest of the world, not only to Am Yisrael, Moshe Rabbeinu was chosen by God, and it wasn't because he had a powerful voice that he was able to convince the Jews. Because people might claim, Le Havdil, to be, you know, mm -hmm. a good talker. If there was a, a very good talker, an orator, that is how he convinced millions of Germans to do what they did. Mm -hmm. So maybe Moshe Rabbeinu convinced these Jews of, of this whole Torah business. Because mm -hmm. he was an excellent orator. Well, he was not. He, he had a stutter problem. He had no skills when he came to speak. So Hashem is choosing somebody like that just to come to show you that what the Jewish people saw and heard was for real. In Har Sinai. It wasn't this, yeah, of course, I don't have, it wasn't the skills of Moshe Rabbeinu. So Hashem is choosing a leader who, of course, is qualified but on, on the other hand, he has some drawbacks. And for, for this, at least for this one reason, there are other reasons too. This one reason to prove that it has nothing to do with Moshe's skills of convincing the Jews. They saw firsthand; they were witnesses. Another idea that is seen in Parshat Korah about Moshe, which made him a very good leader too, and that is one of the reasons he was chosen, was that he was a humble man. 
we have a tradition that before the Shulchan Aruch was supposed to be written <coughs> down, compiled and documented, an important book, part of the Jewish nation, the Shulchan Aruch, compiles the majority of the laws that are relevant today. And so there is, we have a tradition that three individuals were qualified in that generation to write it. The Bet Yosef, the Mokvi Moshe Iserlis, the Ramah, the Ashkenazi, and I think the other one was Rabbi Shlomo and Kabbas. I think so. Anyway, there were three individuals. What made the, the decision that Rabbi Yosef Karo should be the one? It wasn't the flip of the coin, right? It wasn't the uh, uh, voting. Minashamayim, of course, Minashamayim, but how did they decide in Minashamayim? He was the most humble of all. Of all three, he was the strongest one when it came to Mizrat Hanava. That is an extremely important characteristic of Sir Bashamayim. Anava, humbleness. In Spain? In Bashamayim, no. no well, he, he, was in, he was born in Spain, he moved to Portugal, and then eventually moved to Turkey. What did you write the book? Mostly in Turkey, and then a little bit in El Israel too. He, he was in Bulgaria for a while, too. Anyway, he passed away in El Israel. So he was Anav. He was a humble man. That is why he, Zachar, who Zachar, he, he merited to write the Shulchan Aruch. He should come from a humble man. A person who is humble is, is not a, as opinionated. He's able to consider everybody's opinion. This was very important with the Psaq al A person might say, well, this is my opinion. I came to this conclusion. No, if you look at the Shulchan Aruch, you will see <coughs> that there's an opinion that says that he, after he wrote this, the Halakha, he wrote, but there is another opinion that says this, mm-hmm. right? And he had now he gives equal weight to all the great uh, commentaries before him, and he relies basically on three. But uh, nevertheless, he considered everything. He considered everything before him. In any event, Moshe Rabbeinu was also anav. He called Adam. He was the most humble person. And you might think a person in his position would be the most arrogant man, mm-hmm. because if the position has a tendency to corrupt the person. A lot of people who have joined, who, who got into politics before they may have been good people, once they got into politics, they destroyed them. They got used to the power, and they began to abuse it. Right? They began to abuse it. Yeah. Well, Shara Benu, we see that even as a leader, he continues with his humbleness. Where do we see it in this week's parasha? A fight breaks up, uh, breaks out, there's arguments with two camps, the camp of Korach and the other camp. But what does Moshe do? He goes to make peace with them. He doesn't wait for them to come to him. That is an incredible midah, an incredible characteristic. The rabbis tell us is one of the most important in human relationships. Why? Because a lot of times people get into a brawl. You know what a brawl is, mm-hmm. right? And there's arg- yeah. yeah, and they get into argument, and they argue, and that's is also the case between husband and wife. And if one will always wait for the other one to apologize, it's never going to happen. <laughs> Moshe Rabbeinu, therefore, sets an example. You be the first one to go exactly. ahead. Even though, even though you may be right. Finish with it. Don't allow Mahloke to endure. Mahloke division is one of the worst things that, can, that one can be a part of, be involved in, whether it's in one's home or in a community. It, it's destructive. It's very, very destructive. And it's hard to heal. Right? And we, we, we'll see soon that it's something very difficult to heal, very difficult to repair. So Moshe Rabbeinu he continues to be a humble man even after he's a great leader. Even though he knows he's right, he doesn't wait for Korah to approach him. He approaches Korah by the phone and tries to make peace. It didn't work, of course, but at least he tried. Another area where we see that Moshe is not playing, is not, does not play favoritism. He does everything by what Hashem tells him. Who does he give over the reins before he yeah. passes away? Sure. sure. Who would a normal president son. or king give it over to? His son. Mm-hmm. And then says, no, even though they're my children, uh, every father of his children, and it doesn't come first, of course, it's not. Yeshua is the most qualified person. He will lead Am Israel. So this is not a normal book, the Torah. It's not a regular history book. The leader of the Jewish people is humble. He takes all this flack. Is that the right word, flack? Yeah. 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 Like, he stutters. He, init- he goes and asks for, to, for apology. He doesn't give over the reins to his own children. And we're not finished. Now comes the biggest, the biggest raya, the biggest proof that this is Neshama in this whole Torah. Moshe Rabbeinu, the leader of Am Yisrael, the greatest tzaddik v'anav Nikol Adam, even he is criticized by Kadosh Baruch Hu. Ya'an lo emantem bi. Right? Even Moshe Rabbeinu's faults are pointed out in the Torah. Who would write a book about his own faults? Right? Which nation 
You know, France and England had wars, right? If you read French history books, yeah. you read all the good things about France and all the bad things about Britain. If you read British history books, you read it the other way around. Right? <laughs> Every nation likes to write good things about it. This is the only book in the world that a nation criticizes itself, its shortcomings, the problems, and the leader. Obviously, this is to show the Torah in Hashemayim. This is not an ordinary book. So Moshe Rabbeinu is a humble man, and we learn from this that this humbleness is one of the most important characteristics that are both necessary for good leadership and for the home. And the reason why it's important as a quality for leadership and for the home is because it breeds tolerance. A person who is anab, who is humble, it breeds. In other words, it brings about tolerance. He's able to tolerate somebody else's faults. And we all have faults. If you're not able to tolerate somebody else's fault, you won't be able to get along with you. You won't be able to live with him, right? So that's why this is a very important nida. In order for Moshe to be able to tolerate the stubborn people, you know how many times they gave him trouble? He needed to be a humble man. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to. He says, you know what? I quit. Yeah, sure. And he was ready to quit already. Several times. That's right. That's right. That's right. All right. Yeah. Next point. Yeah. Next point is, okay, so now we understand Moshe Rabbeinu, we have to understand Korach. All right, so what's Korach want? Korach is a millionaire. Multi very, right, multi-millionaire. He has everything he ever wants. Right? He has everything he wants. He has everything he wants. So what's the problem? Why, why does he pick a fight over here? So first of all, the rabbis tell us that even though he had a lot of money, he had a problem that many rich people had. When they have a lot of money, they want more. They want kavod, especially. They want to. They want people to honor them. They want to be in a high position. Right? It's a tremendous challenge for a person who has money to not to want kavod, to be happy, content, humble, not show off. It's not simple. Sure. I think I know you know a lot of people like that, right? Or don't you? Yeah. I don't talk about show off. Okay. People who will spend money just to show off. Right. right? They will make big weddings in the community. Not because they have the money necessary, just to show off. It's a tremendous problem. When they it's, a it's a sickness. It's a sickness. They'll give big charity right. and talk about it. Korach was not spared. He had a little bit of this too. Right? It's contagious. He had a little bit of that too. And the rabbis tell us when a person has a problem of kavod, the desire to be honored. Hakina tavav kavod, ulani te kavod motim tadam in haolam. Jealousy or envy. Tava. Unlimited desire, in kavod, the pursuit of honor, they drive a person crazy. Motimta damina olam means they drive him crazy, akedekat to the point that he may lose his life. He might get a heart attack or a stroke if he doesn't get what he wants. Right? He might feel the, uh, he might feel down, right? Or whatever. There's so many things that can go wrong, and a person may, you know, may feel that, you know, that's it. You know, his reputation is ruined, and he may commit even suicide. Right. right. There's all sorts of things that can go wrong. And that comes from Kinata Avabe Kavod. So the Torah, in order to get this symptom of Kinata Avabe Kavod under control, teaches us later on in Parashat Korah, the chapter of Korbanot, of Mat, I'm sorry, Matnot Kehuna. Torah says, what the Leviim get, what the Kohanim get. <coughs> I'll just briefly read it to you. The Torah starts discussing in the middle of Mashat Korah the various gifts, what's called in English the priestly gifts. What belongs to the Kohanim? What belongs to the Leviim? Why is the Torah telling this? What does this have to do with Mashat Korah? It has to show us that everybody has something that Allah Shabbat gave him. And as the rabbis tell us, A person cannot take away or cannot touch, cannot touch what is due for the other person to get. If it's due for him, you cannot take it away from him. It's nasib. Right. It's due to him, it's coming to him, nobody can take it away from him. So the Torah reveals to us in the Matnot Kehuna that Kol Echad Yesh Lo Chelek Everybody has a part, everybody has a share that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave and you cannot take away what is this person. There are Halachot, for example, that you cannot open up a store in front of another store selling the same merchandise. Yeah, Halachot? 
It's a halakha, you know, you cannot be mekapeh, the parnasah of another individual. If there's only the ability to, to provide, if there's only need for one store in the neighborhood, hardware, and you open up the exact same business right across the street, then it's a problem, right? Because there's only room for one store, there's only 100 members in the community, so how many stores do we need for them? So if you open up the exact same business, or you do anything like a pech, a parnasa, to take away the parnasa of another individual, it's a tremendous avon. Doesn't that create enough? No, especially a Jew, but you, you're not allowed to do it to anybody, right? However, that's only true if you can see that there's only room for one. If there's a big community, you don't have to be concerned. Right, right. Exactly, there's room for three, for four, for five stores, right? The problem is that the individual who was there first doesn't think so. He thinks, that's a lack of them, Right? Where in reality, what, what do the rabbis tell us? Yeah, a person cannot take away what is due to him. If you think he's taking away from you, eventually he's gonna, you're going to get it, whatever he's due to you anyway. Mm -hmm. Whatever Rosh Hashanah decided a person is supposed to get, nobody else can take that away from you. You change every year? What? Or you year? can change, of course. Yeah, that's right. What? I mean, you could just say, that's your score. Yeah, of course, don't change. So anyway, the point here is, wherever a person is supposed to receive, that is what he will receive. Nobody can take business away from him. Well, we better compete with him, otherwise we're going to lose business. Not necessarily. Of course, you have to make a shtadlut and, and, and make perhaps advertisement. The person who has tremendous kitachot in Hashem, Hashem will send him the panasa one way or another. You know, he may not have panasa for six months, and all of a sudden he gets a customer for six months profit. It can, it, Hashem has many ways, and he wants to say, on why this has to be like that. Whatever is due to him, nobody can take it away from him. Right? So let, let's say somebody gave you a bad deal. <coughs> right? You had bad deals where uh, you had to share in the loss. But it was written that you were going to make so much, so what's going to happen? Kadosh Baruch Hu will make it up for you in a different way. So don't think, because he cheated me, because of this, because of that, because he wasn't fair with me, I, lo I lose. He cannot take away a penny from what is due to you whether he steals, whether he cheats, whatever is due, is due. So if he took, then Hashem will make it up some, some other way. But that's the same thing too. Not necessarily, not no. always, no, not always. Uh, not always, because he has free will. Yeah. He has free will. It all depends if it's a goy or a Jew. So, a human being has free will, remember. Of course, Hashem allows certain people to do certain things. He doesn't mix in. However, if it's not, if, if you don't deserve it, you won't succeed. No, no, not either he won't succeed or he will succeed, but Hashem will make it up for you in another deal. Because you are not supposed to lose. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to make a certain amount. You see what I mean? So whatever a person is supposed to have in this world, if he believes in that, if he has that clear in his mind, he will not be jealous. Because I'd love to have this, I want this, I want this. If Hashem would want you to have it, he would have given it to you. Okay? The kinata avave kabod, therefore, are symptoms of lack of the munay mitachon Hashem. In thinking, I want more. It's coming to me. I deserve it. I'd like to have it. If Hashem wants to give it to you, He will give it to you. All right. That's the idea of why the Torah discusses Matnot Kehuna, one of the reasons perhaps. It shows that everybody gets something. Kadosh Mahut distributes everything evenly. And He gave everybody something. He didn't give everything to one person or to one tribe. Okay. The next point is why did Korah have complaints to begin with? After He, together with everybody else, believed in Moshe. That he was the leader all along, he believed him. <coughs> all of a sudden, he woke up. What happened until now? And their cousins. Yeah. So the rabbis tell us in Pirkei Avot something incredible. Kol machloket, you have two types of machloket. The machloket of Shem Shamayim and the machloket of Shilol Shem Shamayim. Every argument, every machloket that is for the sake of heaven, you're trying to figure out the truth, like the machloket of Hillel and Shamayim, in the end, mit kayemet, something good will come out of it. What is that? The truth. In other words, you will accomplish something positive. You know, because what are you both doing, the two sides? You're trying to find out the truth. As what are you trying to be Mekadem? You're trying to be Mekadem Shem Shamayim. You want to find out the truth for the sake of heaven. You want Am Yisrael to learn more, to know more, right? So you're trying to figure out what's best, what's the correct, according to the Halakha. That works. That Mahloket will bring, bear good fruit. Kol Mahloket Shem Shem Shamayim. Like who? Like the Mahloket of Korah Ba'adato. So the rabbis use that as an example of a Mahloket which is not Shem Shamayim. Sofa Betelah. 
In other words, nothing good will come out of it. What does it mean, Shanad Hashem Shemaim? It means that the whole idea of the fight, you know, the argument, and you know, the division, is not is a personal thing. It's like Kademet Asma. They want to they want to gain something out of it. They want they, there's a personal gain, a personal agenda, like they say in English, hidden in this whole argument. There's a certain bias here. Mm-hmm. Even though, even though, even though Korach was a Talmud Chacham, and he, he was a smart person, and he was, he thought he meant Hashem Shammai. How do we know he thought he meant Hashem Shammai? Because he wasn't asking for money. Mm-hmm. He was asking for a Misra Dosha. Mm-hmm. He was asking for a holy position. This is, that's all he was asking. He was asking to also partake. So we knew, we know that he also thought, what did Korach think? Korach did think that he was doing something to Shem Shemayim. What did, Mabi Kesh, what did he ask? We asked for Misrach Dosha, for a holy position, not for money. What's the problem over here? The problem is that he didn't ask himself, like, like people should do, why, why am I really fighting for? What am I really arguing for? Because if a person is fair and he analyzes the situation, am I doing it for my personal gain? Or is it really purely the Shem Shemayim? He would realize quickly that it's for a personal gain. All right, this, what this comes to show you is that even though Korah thought that he was doing the right thing, everybody is capable of making a mistake. If he doesn't think about it, he thinks he's doing it a Shem Shemayim, but in, in reality, for personal gain, he might easily make a mistake in thinking that it's a Shem Shemayim. Anyway, so before a person begins to argue, before a person begins to suggest something, he should ask himself, why am I doing this for? Is it really because I truly want to advance this cause for the sake of heaven? Or is it perhaps because I have something to gain here? Person, some po- po- political gain. What politics? That's what it's all about, right? What am I going to gain out of it? A lot of leaders, and that goes back to the original point, the reason why democracy does not work for Amis Sarayat is because a lot of the leaders, even if they were chosen and they were good, if they want to continue to be leaders, if they want to be re-elected, they might not do what's right. You want to why? Sarayat. Because they want, to, they want to make people happy, right? Otherwise, they're not going to vote for me. Yes. See what I mean? That's a very, very tricky situation. It has to be a person that has the Rashamai, a person that has the Rashamai, who believes, uh, knows that he's qualified. Otherwise, not everybody will be successful in a position. Even though they start off saying, oh, I'm going to help and I'm going to do everything. Yeah. But in the end, you know, they're tested. They're challenged. I mean, what's more important? Their personal gain? They want to be reelected. They want to hold on to that position? Or what Hashem wants? And Korah, of course, failed this test. The next question is, why did the fight come out in the open? Why was there a problem? You know, when you have a disagreement, you have a problem with someone, the best way to handle it is privately. Husband and wife have a problem, the best way to handle it is not in front of the children. Sometimes I know it's hard to control. You're upset, you yell, you criticize, you complain, and everybody hears it. Okay. But, try, one has to try his best to reserve any arguments or any complaints for private. So, because less damage is done, less people hear about it, less people see it, and you're avoiding you're avoiding the problems. Here, Kora took it out to the open. All of Amni said was why? It's important. Exactly. When people take something out to the open, they want to get the most support possible. They want to influence others. By himself, he would have been he would have had a harder time to convince. He would not have had the support. Right. But he, he knew who the Jewish people were, and he knew that he would be able to walk. And maybe even bribe them. <laughs> He's a good guy. He had money. He had right? money. Good right. talker. Right. So that is the reason why he took it out to the open. Partly to get everybody involved, to get more support, and to have people basically agree with him. Now, what happened as a result of this going out in the open is that it became tremendous Hedul Hashem. And as a result of that, even young boys under the age of 20, who usually do not have, have Mitabi De Shamayim, they died anyway. Because of the tremendous Avono, the tremendous sin of Hilul Hashem, the disgrace of Hashem's name, right? Okay. Because it was in the open, exactly because it was in the open, look what it led to. Had it been privately, less people would have been uh, affected by it, right? But of course, he had a reason why he wanted to be made publicized, but as a result of that, look what happened, that even younger people were affected, were, were, were killed by it. Okay, next question. Why did we need to have such a big miracle? What was the unusual miracle here? It was very unusual. The earth swallowed them up. 
alive. In other, in other, at other, in other incidents, they were killed. They died. There was a magifa. There was a plague of sorts. Fire. All sorts of things. Here it was very unusual. Even though Moshe recommended it, but why did Moshe recommend it? It was an unusual punishment that they should be swallowed up by the ground, alive. So Shlomo Melech tells us in Ovat Lo Yuchalit Kon. Obviously, when you have a Hadul Hashem, it's a situation where it's difficult to repair. It's one of those situations that you can't fix it. It was done, the damage is done, it's very difficult to correct. Hashem had to come out very harshly, very severely. It was a big, he a big accusation against Am Yisrael. Machlok is a terrible accusation against even a couple. One has to be very careful. There is a, it's written down that if a house burns down, if there's a fire in a house, it could very possibly be because there was ish between the husband and wife. And that destroys the home. The fire consumes the home. And it was machloket kaas is very, very destructive. Hashem had to demonstrate that this is a terrible sin, that this is one of the worst things for Ami said that they should be the machloket, not united. But why an unusual? <coughs> because unfortunately the people tend to many times think, Mikre. It was an earthquake on the Richter scale of 7.5 because there's a fault running in the San Andreas and whatever. You see what I mean? So people think when there's a major catastrophe that it could be in the nature. Hashem didn't do it. Hashem over here did something that nobody should have any doubt that this is not geological in nature. This is Mamash Minashamayim. Just like in Makat Kinin in the time when there was the life even the Egyptian Hartumim said, Et by Elohim. Hashem had to take these makot to the Egyptian magician. So they, of all people in the world, should say, this is not magic. This is Et by Elohim. Yeah. Same idea. Hashem had to come up with something unusual. Everybody should, should say, I'm not sure. Right? Moshe Emet, the Torah to Emet. And that is what the Gemara says until today. Korah is saying it in the ground. Moshe Emet, the Torah to Emet. Yeah. 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 Anyway, so Hashem has to demonstrate this very, very strongly to leave no doubt in anybody's mind. This is the case. And that is what we see in Pashat, the Hokotai, Pashat Kitavo, also in the Tochaha, that if Amish if Amisha does not get the message the first time, the message intensifies. Say, why is this happening to me? It must be because Hashem is not with us. Right? So eventually the idea is that the people should come to realize and admit that this is because Hashem is not with them. Anyway, so that is why it happens so severely and so in, in so, such an unusual way. Next question. Pashat Korach is, okay, they did a terrible thing. Why didn't Moshe Rabbeinu give them the chance to do Teshuvah? Teshuvah, you give everybody a chance to do Teshuvah, even though Moshe did give them a little bit of time, a few hours or so, a day or so, a day, mm -hmm. right? Why didn't he give them a chance to do Teshuvah? Bad example. This is a terrible example, because what happens when people hear or see this? As I said before, in a certain situation, the Shlomo Mela says, Lo yuchalit kon. Typical example that the Zohar says of a situation that you can't repair is somebody who commits an adulterous act and a mamzer is born. No. Right? Somebody that went, that lived with a married woman. The child that comes out of this is a mamzer, a married woman, right? Can you fix that? Mamzer is mamzer, gamarno. You cannot repair it. And the Zohar says, Misken, what did the, what did the child do? Even though there's Cheshbonot Melemala of why this Neshama became Amzer, nevertheless, he's still a Misken because he didn't do anything on his own. That's true. And it's something that you can't repair. You can't marry just anybody. That's a typical example of Mubatu Yuchari Kovat. There are Avonot in this world. There are sins that are committed that are very difficult to repair. One of them is Chilul Hashem, as you say. The only way the Kabbalah says you can repair Chilul Hashem, perhaps, is with Kiddush Hashem, sanctifying Hashem's name. This situation that there was a tremendous Hilul Hashem, that they actually contested or defied Moshe and challenged him in such an open and public way, with such a terrible avon, that Kadosh Baruch says, there is no more chance to do the Shuvah this. Why? Because of you, you said the impression that was made on the people, what's the, why is Hilul Hashem so bad? The impression that people, what they heard and saw with their own eyes, what's recorded in their mind, how are you going to erase that? If a person embarrasses, Ruben embarrasses Shimon in public, okay? Ten days later he regrets it. Can he fix it? <coughs> go to the same people. It has to be the same people. Are you going to get all the same people that were there at the time? 
very difficult. Very Sometimes it's possible. Very if it's in the Bet Knesset, and the same Bet Knesset people come mm-hmm. together mm-hmm. the following week, maybe, mm-hmm. if you're lucky, yeah. then it's possible. But otherwise, in public, you see why Halbanat Pnei Chaviro Barabim is such a tremendous avon to, to, to embarrass somebody in public is such a tremendous thing. How are you going to get everybody back to repair the damage that was done, to remove that erroneous impression that they have in their mind, that terrible impression that's going to be with them for the rest of their life? You know what some of them may think? These are Jews. This is the way they behave. Mm-hmm. People build up impressions based on what they witness and what, what the eyes see and what the mind records. So some things are so terrible, they're almost irreparable. The damage is done. Yep. Shem says, no, no, we don't give them time for the Shabbat here. Can't repair it. You can't fix it. So it has to be. Okay. The last point in Parashah is a very important point. It has to do with women. With women. Who instigated Korah? You think he started, uh, it was yeah, his idea? He's your wife. Huh? His, his wife. How did you know? <laughs> you told us. No, but you know it from life, from experience too, right? <laughs> <laughs> they say in French, yeah. in front de tuy and all. Yeah, of course, true. that's where they take it from. In the Midrash, this Midrash says exactly that. A wife can destroy a man, or she can build a man. You know what the famous saying is? Behind every good man, successful man, there's a there's a great Strong woman too. Woman. The woman is was able to maintain the structure of this household while this man yeah. was doing whatever was doing. Yeah. She provided the support and the structure. It's better the and the father died than the mother died. So anyway, so the Midrash tells us over here, let's go behind the scenes now and figure out what happened here. What was happening behind the scenes? Well, behind the scenes, you had the wife of Om Ben Pelet and the wife of Korah were major players here. The wife of Korah is the one that pushed him and encouraged him and supported him to go in and do all of this. And the wife of Om Ben Pelet, who was going to join Korah, what made him stop? His wife. What did his wife do? She, she stood. She, he said, how can, how can I say no? Well, they're going to come and ask for me not to join them, to join the gang. He said, don't worry. She stood at the front of the tent and made herself not snoa. She was taking care of her hair and her personal needs. So as soon as people came asking for her, they saw her, of course, they went away. She said, you can't. So she, by standing, by sitting in front of the oil of the tent, and her husband was inside, saved her husband. <coughs> she saved his life. Otherwise, he would have had the exact same fate as the rest of them. Eshet Korah, because of what she did, because of the instigate of what she did, she destroyed her husband. That was the difference between the two. Anyway, with this, with this Midrash, we, we can appreciate and understand a little bit better why the Torah calls the woman an Ezer Kenegdo. It seems contradictory. The Torah says a woman, one's wife, is an Ezer Kenegdo. Hashem created her to be a help and to be against him. Wait, what is it? Is it a help or is it against? Isaac, which one is it? I don't know. I tried to analyze. It's confused. It's a very difficult question. Yeah. A woman is supposed to complement the two together. If it's the correct zivug, it's mm-hmm. supposed to be an ezer. Ezer can go obviously pashut pshat means that she's supposed to complement and fill in where he's lacking. Each one is lacking. The two complement the two come each other. But the rabbis also say that can go really means can go. Hashem can use her as a tool to oppose her husband, go against him. Like the, like the rabbis tell us, <laughs> like the rabbis tell us in pasuk, when Hashem approves of a person's deeds, his ways. Even his enemies make peace with him. Who are his enemies? Even his wife. If the wife does not make peace with you, maybe you're some, something that you're doing is wrong. Not necessarily, but it could be. But anyway, so the rabbi tells us follows. What's the idea of Ezra can go together in one word, in one pasuk? Because she's both. <coughs> because of all the individual, of all people in the world, she is the one that knows her husband the best. Supposedly. Supposedly. She may not understand him well, but she at least knows him better than anybody else. So she's able to best be kenegdo, weak, weak point, and right, in pointing out his weak points and criticizing. Right, exactly. And then vice versa, on <coughs> third option. Oh, of course, but she doesn't accept criticism. <laughs> on the way down. Right. Not the only thing. She's she's the the opposite, she can yeah. find his. <laughs> she can find his weak points and beat them strong. So she make him stronger. But anyway, that is why the rabbis also tell us that a lot depends on the, on the woman. The beracha, the beracha in the house, 
depends on the woman. Ena beracha shuyah be before she lagan ela bigal hamisha. Only because of the woman, mm. she brings beracha to the house. So when a person is single, he's missing a lot. He's missing beracha. He's missing shalom. He's missing a choma. Choma is a wall, a wall against the yitzhara that is always after him because he's friendly. You not. So it's a tremendous blessing for a person to be married. Even even if a person's wife passed away or he got divorced for whatever reason, he should remarry. He should never be alone. Not to yota adam levado. Because even though one may, fi- one may find all sorts of faults with women, because it's a completely different nature, which I'm still learning Sinidin. today. Right? Completely different nature, right? Nevertheless, it's an important asset for, for one to have, because not only does she provide a homa, a wall against the Yisadat for protection, she brings in Beracha and she brings in... And the person who's single, he's missing all of these things. And that is why the, the Rabbis encourage a person uh, to be married to alone. and to be very careful not to hurt the feelings of his wife too much to the point that it brings her to cry. One has to be very no. careful that his wife should never shed a tear. But if she sheds a tear, that could interfere with his final side. Yeah. Okay, that's what they tell us. Yeah, that's true. In other words, even though they're very sensitive and sometimes they cry for no reason, yeah. we're not talking about that. We're talking about real tears. So one has to be careful not to insult, not to offend. That That is the, many times, that is the woman that Akadosh Baruch Hu decided that she belongs to you that from this combination, certain children, certain neshamot have to come out. And unless, some, unless it becomes totally unbearable, or if she goes against the Torah, right? If she does not want to fulfill the mitzvot, she goes against her husband, she cheats on her husband, she does things which are terrible. Now, then of course it's a mitzvah, you're not allowed to continue to live with you She have, took this to the women, she does a class for women. Yeah. There, are, there are people that are no good. We're not talking about that you have to, you know, stick it out with them. But in this week's parashah and parashakoh, we see that so much depends on the woman. Both the destruction of one's home and the blessing of one's the home. The saving, yeah. The husband is away from the, from the house most of the day. Who takes care of the children? The mother. So when a person wants to get married, he shouldn't think only of a, as a companion. Who will make my best companion? Who will be my best friend? She, who will also be the best mother of my children? Mm-hmm. Not everybody thinks that way. They're concentrated. They're yeah. concentrated. I know when a person eventually gets married and he marries his true zibug, and he looks back and says, "You know what? There were some other ones that I liked more." But yes. thank God I got that but one. Thank God I got this one because she's also a, a good mother for the children. Who knows what the other one would have been? Mm-hmm. Right? Even though the other ones could have been good too, maybe. maybe. Yeah, yeah. But this one, the zibug, is the is the best match. And it requires a certain emunah bitachon. Today, the reason why people have so many divorces and so many problems is because they don't tolerate each other. They don't want to have the patience. They don't want to be, like we said before, humble and apologize and be first to, to try to reconcile the differences. And when a machloket gets out of control, I want this tip. when a machloket gets out of control and, and wounds are building up, that, and you know what happens when a, with, a, with a wound that you continuously it goes well, deeper and deeper. No, no, you never let the it's scab like, develop. Yeah, a, There's never a scab. It's never healing. Yeah. Then they go to 20 years after the promise has built up, they go to a marriage count. <laughs> how, how are they going to feel? They have all these ill feelings built up. You take care of the problems immediately. Yeah, anyway, even though this is a completely different subject, the point is still the same. <clears throat> that the mahlokin in this parasha was a terrible avon, and unfortunately it started, it started off with a woman. She at least encouraged them. Yeah. And what does that come to teach us? It comes to teach us that a person has to be very careful what he tells his wife. Not only are you can't tell a shonara, obviously, but you can, even things which are not lashonara. I had a bad day today. Uh, my 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 boss criticized me. Your wife may lose respect for you. You mean you will let him criticize you? <laughs> All of us. You thought she was going to have sympathy for you. If she was going to make you a good she dinner, and said, "Don't feel bad." Now here she can. You never know. They're you unpredictable. Want, did right? you answer back? Why did you tell? <laughs> Why did you tell him off? <laughs> No, that doesn't end over there. It doesn't end over there. Uh, she will pick the phone call you. She's tomorrow. gonna pick up the phone. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> go go tell him. Yeah, the other person is wife. This is how Machlok it begins. Gadol Hashalom. That that the rabbis continues to remind us. Gadol Hashalom. Peace is more important than anything else. It pays to keep quiet. It pays not to talk about everything. It pays. It pays to apologize even if, if you're wrong. Yeah. Even I'm sorry. Even if you're right. It pays to do whatever you can to bring about peace in the home. Shalom is the greatest beracha for one's home, for one's relationship with, with other people, for, for everything, and especially for Amisai.